to um, welcome up uh, His Excellency um, Basil uh, Marashenko. Thank you very much, Hamas. It's been a very early start for me um, today. Uh, I, I was at six o'clock in the morning at TV uh, New Zealand. Uh, so I had to get up at 4.30. Um, and then I went and, and was at seven at Today FM. And so, and then I came here. Um, but I'm very, I still got a whole day ahead of me, but, but I'll try to, um, thanks to Coca-Cola, I've tried to get some sugar. So I hope I can go on and entertain you as much as I can, uh, talking about this very serious issue uh, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And there are many different aspects that we can discuss, that we can talk, but I understand we have a very knowledgeable audience here. So I see people who, who've probably had careers maybe in foreign service, uh, some masters and PhD students, and there are many other people watching me online maybe some government departments as well. Uh, so um, I will try to speak uh, short. Uh, you come up with your questions because people may have different interests and uh, may be interested in different aspects of, of this invasion. Uh, just a bit about myself. I'm a political appointee. Uh, that's my first uh, job for the government ever. Uh, previously, I ran my own business with my business partners in Ukraine for 20 years. Uh, apart from that, I was um, heavily involved in Ukraine's civil society. Uh, throughout my career, I, I was involved in setting up three different non-governmental organizations, um, starting with the first one when I was still 19 at the university, and then uh, the other two I was um, involved in 2014 when Russians invaded us first time. And, uh, and one of those organizations was called Ukraine Crisis Media Center, which is a media organization funded by international donors with the goal of um, amplifying Ukraine's voice internationally, fighting Russian disinformation uh, and hybrid warfare threats. But apart from that, um, though I'm new to the government, but I'm not new to the foreign affairs and, and, and international relations, and uh, this is my educational background is in IR and then international political economy in London. But I've also, um, studied in other parts of the world, in Sweden, in Canada, in the US. Um, so, and also was involved in many campaigns and projects in public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, <coughs> investment promotion, expert promotion. So I pretty much was involved in every aspect that every diplomat is involved into, but I've always done it on behalf of being still part of business or civil society. Uh, so uh, I'd be, and now, as, as since I arrived in, in Australia in, uh, in March, uh, I kind of became a defense attaché out there because there is no defense attaché at our small embassy. Uh, so more recently, I've been doing lots of military um, cooperation work. Um, and I was very pleased to present my credentials to your governor general last week in Wellington. It was a very warm uh, ceremony. And my family uh, enormously enjoyed it, um, except for my older daughter. Uh, she's now in Europe. Uh, but um, my son was very excited to, met, uh, to meet the, the Mari and, uh, and to see the ceremony uh, uh, himself. Look, uh, I don't know where I should start. Uh, uh, and um, there are so many different issues I want to tell you about. But look, uh, just to give you sort of in a nutshell, um, kind of my general presentation on where I start uh, is that uh, I think the world has changed. The world has changed dramatically. Um, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia was something we couldn't believe in. Uh, we couldn't believe it in 2013 and 2014. Uh, we couldn't believe it again earlier this year. Um, so we are talking about irrational behavior in international relations and the role of irrational behavior. And I think uh, that brings lots of interesting discussions and lots of food for thought for different countries in different parts of the world, including here in the Indo-Pacific, including here in, 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 in New Zealand. I think nobody expected that Ukraine would mount such a big fight most of the Western analysts and military experts predicted Ukraine would fall in three days. 
and uh, but it didn't. Ukrainian society uh, has demonstrated resilience, resilience the world has not seen since the Second World War. And we've been able to fight. Many Ukrainians are dying now, and uh, many get killed as we speak. The questions which are awkward, which are not politically correct, must be asked. How many New Zealanders are ready to fight and die for their country? Can you raise your hand? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, it's a tough question, isn't it? And uh, somebody mentioned to me in Australia, you don't ask this question, it's politically incorrect. But you see, if you asked me 10 years ago, would Russia invade? Are you ready to die? I was saying, are you crazy? It's impossible. Why would they invade? It doesn't make sense. And I think these are the questions we have to think about because the world has changed. No matter how this all plays out, it's out there, it happened. You can't backtrack, you can reverse it, it's already happened. We see an example of a country changing borders by force. Of course, the way it ends will depend on who else is gonna be emboldened to do the same. In what part of the world? In the Middle East, in Africa, in the Indo-Pacific, but that's out there. It's happening now, and we'll see more of that. And the climate change is happening. The world population is growing. As the access to food is becoming a scarcity, countries which have water, which have food, are in high demand. New Zealand is one of those. So as a population in Asia and Africa will grow, somebody needs to feed those people. Water is becoming new oil, clean water. There's plenty of that water here. So New Zealand looks like a very good country which could become a source of food and water. What if there is competition for food and water? What's gonna happen? What if somebody decides to invade New Zealand? Who's going to defend you? No, that's the question. Who's going to defend you? Australia, I hear that all the time. Well, what if Australia is dis distracted by boost fires? What if Australia is flooded? What is if Australia is busy in, 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 in defending herself? America? Well, what if America is busy? You see, that's a question which, again, is not politically correct to ask, but we're here in the audience, which is very knowledgeable, very educated. And I, I want you to think about it because the reason I want you to think about it because we didn't think about it in Ukraine for a long time. Since Ukraine became independent in 1991, it was a very kind of peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union. While there were skirmishes in Transnistria and Moldova, in the Horne Karabakh, in between Armenia and uh, and um, uh, Azerbaijan, skirmishes in, in 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 the Caucasus in Georgia, but generally, overall, it was a very peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union. Ukraine had the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons, it's the second largest in the world. So there is only very few countries which have voluntarily gave up their nuclear weapons. In 1994, Ukraine did it voluntarily. Would Russia invade if Ukraine had nuclear weapons? No. You see, that's a question. The reason India and Pakistan developed their nuclear programs is to actually prevent the other party to attack, to attack it, right? And they've used whatever they, they could to develop nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons have always been a deterrent. They've been a deterrent in, this, in the Cold War because the use of nuclear weapons actually means it's the end of the world. So nuclear weapon as a deterrent has always served the purpose. There've been plenty of proxy wars in the Cold War times 
but it never actually came to a direct confrontation between the Soviet Union and the US. And there's always been a deterrent. But the world has changed. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, got the security and guarantees given to it by the Budapest Memorandum, an international document that we signed up to, which included the signatures of Russia and other partners. Ukrainian Socialist Republic was a founding member state of the United Nations. Very few people actually know about it. Only three countries out of the Soviet Union were involved in setting up the UN. It was Ukrainian Socialist Republic, Belarus Socialist Republic, and Soviet Union. I think it's pretty phenomenal. So even during the Soviet times, Ukraine has always maintained a separate mission uh, in New York and Geneva. Of course, it was kind of, they had no, no say there. They were all directed out of Moscow, but that's a fact. And that's interesting to look at this from that point of view. But you see the UN Charter and all other international conventions which uh, Ukraine has been party to, and as well as Russia, Russia has violated. And what happened? Nothing. The problem with international law, there's really no consequences for violating international law. There is no sanctions, right? There is no, because in domestic law, if you make, commit a crime, you get punished, right? International public law, if you violate international public law, it's very difficult to punish you. Very difficult. Well, of course, there are cases of, 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 of some leaders being prosecuted and actually eventually jailed for the crimes against humanity and, 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 and war crimes. But generally, it's just impossible to, 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 to have any influence about, over any country. And if you get somebody changing borders by force, what an inspiration it is for others who may dream to do the same thing, authoritarian leaders. As the liberal democracy is in decline, there is a rise of authoritarians. Authoritarian system seems to be efficient. It works. Liberal democracy is in decline. Over how many people got out of poverty in China thanks to its successful reforms? China has liberalized a great deal. It joined WTO, World Trade Organization, in 2001, locked in the reforms, changed the system, and got half of its population out of poverty. Amazing, phenomenal. But China kept its system, political system, strong and intact. But it proved that it's actually a model for development. And it works. Many other countries are following the same route. For many countries, human rights, freedom of press, freedom of speech is not that important. And in many developed countries, we take it for granted. Our ability to have free press, free media. But many countries don't have it. Ukraine has been going through some hard times. This was not an easy ride for Ukraine. The system that, that, that emerged uh, in the 90s created an opportunity for the oligarchs, ultra high net worth individuals to privatize key assets in Ukraine, become very rich, which created a system of endemic corruption. Well, that's not only Ukraine's problem, that's the problem of most of the post-Soviet countries, but also many other fledgling democracies globally in different parts of the world. Nevertheless, Ukraine has always been the freedom-loving country. We've never tolerated our presidents for too long. The only president who lost two terms was Kuchma in the 90s. He was elected for two terms. Every other president was kicked out as we got rid of, 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 of we, as, as soon as we got tired of that president, Ukrainians would elect a new one. And it's a sign of democracy, isn't it? Vladimir Putin's rise to power came at the end of 99, and he never left power, right? He became the richest man in, in the world. 
he created probably the, the closest system you can imagine. And he came up with a mission and his mission is very simple. His mission is to revive the grandeur of the Soviet Union to be feared. In Russia, to be feared means to be respected. It's a different culture. We in Ukraine can help you in New Zealand to understand Russia. We'd be happy to take your students to Ukraine and teach them Russian language. We have the best professors of Russian language in Ukraine. And we can help you build your own capabilities of understanding Russia. I understand it's not your part of the world. You'd be more focused on China. But look, I think everything is very related. And, and we can help you out with that. Vladimir Putin's invasion eight years ago has done more for creating cohesion in our society than anybody else. During the past eight years, you've seen the rise and the birth of Ukrainian political nation. People of different groups, Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking, Jews, Muslims, Protestants, ethnic minorities, all got together, united around one goal. And the goal is to defeat the Russians, defeat the invasion. And I think never in our life we've been actually more united than this time. And it's all happening because somebody out there in Moscow decided, well, it's time to change history. It's time to revive the Soviet Union or something which would be similar to that. After the revolution in Russia, 1917, Ukraine proclaimed independence. We had independence for about three and a half years, four years, different governments, 1917 until 1921. And then the communists came, they crashed Ukraine, and annexed it and created this Ukrainian Socialist Republic. But we always remembered what we saw there, that brief period of independence. We can actually trace down Ukraine's sovereign history or, or spaces of sovereignty back to all the times. Starting from a medieval state of Kievan Rus in the 10th, <laughs> century, 10th, 11th, 12th century, going back to later times, 500 years later, to the Cossack Republic, the statehood of the Cossack Republic, and tumultuous times being at the crossroads between the big polish Lithuanian state, between Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire, Scandinavian empires, and the Swedish Empire. So being there at the crossroads of that Ukraine, territory and Ukrainian people were under different influences throughout our history. Nevertheless, it's only this time, especially now, with this major assault on Ukraine, we've been able to get together. We've been able to actually create a society that is now focused on one goal. And that one goal is to defeat the Russians. It's not easy, it's tough. So in my class of 60 people who graduated from Institute of International Relations in 2003, two of my classmates got killed. One classmate got killed on the third day of war near Hostomel in the military airport. The other one got killed in mid-March near Chernihiv. Both were part of the armed forces of Ukraine. Both had combat experience from 2014. And both were my classmates studying international relations they could have been diplomats. They could have been like me standing here telling you, giving you lectures. But they died protecting their own country. Why should New Zealand support Ukraine? That's a question which I get all the time. I think the answer is very simple. If you don't support Ukraine, Who's going to support you when you're in time of trouble? It's very important to send that message that bullies out there, there's no tolerance towards that. 
and send it up to bullies is what New Zealand should do and probably have done throughout the history as part of ANZAC, as part of other experience that your defense forces have overseas, supporting the US and NATO missions, the UN missions, etc. Look, these are very difficult questions to discuss because once it's so far away from you, you don't really get emotionally involved, right? Except for reading the news. But even how many more stories about Russian war crimes can you read? I remember how voraciously I read everything about Afghanistan and Iraq. How long did I last? Oh, I don't know, maybe half a year, but then I stopped reading. Because once you've exhausted all the stories, you kind of plug off, right? You've got your own stuff to do, and it's kind of far away from you anyways. So do you still keep on reading stories on Ukraine? Good, good. I mean, we have a different audience here. But generally, what about general population of New Zealand? You see, the, because if people have got their own issues to deal with, right? They've got their own families, own, no problems, their own work. It's very difficult to maintain interest to, to, to war crimes, right? Once you read about rape, torture, summer executions, it's kind of tough, huh? Not every person psychologically can take that. But we have no choice, so we have to go through that. The answer is very simple to the question of why should you support Ukraine? Because look, the implications of this war are felt globally. It's not only the European security which is undermined, global security is undermined, security in the Pacific is undermined. The search in prices for commodities, the search in prices for energy, and the high inflation here is a result of war in Ukraine. Just as simple as that. Ukraine is one of the biggest producers of food in the world. Now we haven't been able to export anything for the past six months. Last year, harvest was 107 million tons of grain. Do you know how much we need grain domestically? Three million. The other 104 million tons is exported to Middle East and Africa. We've been all, we only started exporting last week or, or two weeks ago, and it's still a trickle. It's very difficult for us to get to the level that we need. We need to export 5 million tons per month, and it's not there. That includes wheat, corn, animal feed, vegetable oils, sunflower oil. The prices for bread in chart tripled. That's already causing demonstrations and political instability in the poorest countries of Africa and Middle East. Don't you think this is what Russia wants? Because once you have instability everywhere, it's kind of like, oh, we need to stop it. We need to give up. Oh, if Russia wants what Eastern Ukraine, let's give it up. Why bother? If that can, if that can stop the, the suffering of the people globally, why don't we stop it? Why don't we push Ukraine to give up? Why is Ukraine fighting? This war is existential for us because if Russia stops fighting, it's the end of the war. If Ukrainians stop fighting, it's the end of Ukraine. It's not about the land that Russians want. Russians want to defeat Ukraine's sovereignty. As simple as that. I've given you too many different difficult examples, but imagine a country which has large population somewhere here in the region, needing your food, comes over, takes over your northern island, right? And the southern island goes like, oh, we, should, we need to give up, give up fighting because look, if we can bring peace, let's give up the northern island, right? If that's a, a solution for peace, let's do it. You know, 10 years later, they'll come and take over the southern island, of course. I don't want to give you some hard examples. It's kind of difficult to imagine that it's possible, but it is. It is actually possible. We'll live it. Non-nuclear country, right? New Zealand, since when? 1981? Five. Five. Look, this is all great, you know, when, when Chernobyl 
nuclear power plant exploded in 1986, nuclear weapons didn't seem like a good nuclear energy, right? It didn't seem to be very sustainable. And of course, the, 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 the Japanese uh, tragedy of, of, of their nuclear power plant over 10 years ago prodded some countries to change their policy. Germany decided to phase out its nuclear energy. Also, they phased out all the coal, fighting climate change. So what was a bet? The bet was Russian gas. How sustainable was that to make a bet on the, on the supply of the Russian gas? The whole German economy depends on that. 60% of energy comes from Russia. And it's not only Germany, many other European nations depend totally on the Russian gas. Russia makes around a billion dollars every day on selling gas and another billion or two from selling oil. As the prices for oil and, and gas have gone up, Russia has been actually making more money than, than before. Because there are many countries who just need that energy, like India, like China, like others, or others have no alternatives. So Russia can sustain this war for a long time. They can beef up the military, they can send the most sophisticated weapons into Ukraine, such as supersonic bombs, thermobaric bombs, cluster bombs. Some of them are banned, but it doesn't matter. They can kill more Ukrainians, they will send them because they got huge stockpiles of that. We don't. We like artillery guns. We don't have enough jets. We don't have enough tanks. We don't have long range missiles. We have nothing to fight with. Look, this is going to be a long conversation. I can talk about different issues, but let's let's just call it a break. And maybe you can you can ask me questions, or you can give your comments. By the way, I mean this is the, because uh, that that would be really great. Thank, thank you, Ambassador. Um, I'll try just uh, stand here because we might get some online um, questions as well. Um, uh, I will use my prerogative as, as uh, the chair and, and um, pose one to start with. And I guess you've been getting this question quite a bit. But um, what's your appraisal of the New Zealand government's response to um, uh, the invasion of, of Ukraine? And what could the government do more? Look, I, this is a question I get on television all the time, right? Uh, you don't have large defense forces, and uh, that's as we understand it. Uh, you don't have tanks, you don't have jets, you don't have long range missiles, you don't have nuclear submarines, right? So, I mean, we, we, you, you, you help as much as you can. It's not that I'm here to demand for more, I can only ask for more, right? And it's up to your government to decide and to, to see what they can provide. And of course, Ukrainian people are extremely thankful, and Ukrainian President Zelensky is very thankful for that support. Um, so whatever we can get is good because we're dying. So if you can send more, if you got more in your in, in your in your in your in your warehouses, please send more. I don't know what's what's the availability. If you got javelin in your garage, let me know. I can pick it up. <laughs> we need it. If not, well, tell me how what else you can do to help us, right? Um, but but at the end of the day. 40, over 40 million of assistance uh, from, from New Zealand, some of that was military assistance, some of that was on non lethal sort of training, um, military training, and like the last 120 soldiers, which now are going to be dispatched to the UK to train Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, it's a great help. Uh, New Zealand could take part in Ukraine's reconstruction and the fast recovery in their built of schools, hospitals, utilities, in long term reconstruction, uh, more. Companies from New Zealand can come and invest in Ukraine. Institutional investors can come and participate in long-term reconstruction. Because for us to move forward, we need to build a strong economy and a strong military. That's the only way for us to move forward. And this is what we, we need. And uh, you have a very developed and sophisticated uh, primary industries, agriculture. And you have some of the best technology for the production of dairy and meat and wine. And we could definitely benefit from that. We could learn from your expertise, from your get access to your capital, get access to, to your people who can actually come and help us uh, in Ukraine as we move forward. Of course, it's not immediate. But look, 
uh, Ukraine has been a place that many world leaders have come to to support. Uh, I was extremely pleased to be there on a trip with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. It was just five weeks on the job. First time ever in the history of our bilateral relations. He traveled to Kyiv in, uh, in early July, spent 12 hours in Kyiv. We went to Irpin, to Bucha, to Hostomel. He had three hours meeting with the president of Ukraine. He's been there. He, he, was, he was really moved by what he saw there. President Zelensky would be delighted to see Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in Kyiv. I'd be happy to facilitate the trip. Um, I know she's got a busy schedule, but I, I'm sure she can, she can make a trip. And you see, what is important for us is the voice of New Zealand. You have stellar reputation. Everybody loves New Zealand. Everybody wants to come and visit New Zealand. You have impeccable rep reputation here in the, in, in the Pacific. You're a very peaceful country. That's good. Let's leverage your reputation to help Ukraine. Every vote in the United Nations counts. We need those votes. We, we need those votes from the Pacific Island nations because every country is one vote. If you can help Ukraine with that, please do. We have a large indigenous population in Ukraine. This is where you can really step up your efforts because indigenous population of Ukraine are Crimean Tatars. They live in Crimea. In 1944, Joseph Stalin forcefully deported those indigenous people out of Crimea to Central Asia. Many of them died on their way. When Ukraine became independent, we welcomed those indigenous people to Ukraine. They came back. We now have over 350,000 or 400,000 people, Crimean Tatars. They are Turkish background, Muslims. When Russia invaded Crimea in, in 2014, these people are under heavy attack. Activists are abducted and killed. Many have disappeared. Many are in the Russian jails as political prisoners. Indigenous foreign policy is something sacred for New Zealand. So why not step up your efforts to make sure that these indigenous people of Ukraine can find a safe haven when they reunite with Ukraine? The leadership of Crimean Tatars are in, in Kyiv. The first deputy minister of foreign affairs, Amina Japar, she's Crimean Tatar. We get many of them in the parliament. Many of them are, have senior government jobs. Many are running businesses. Why not help indigenous people of Ukraine? There's a track which hasn't yet been explored, but supporting Crimea and making the Crimea is returned to Ukraine is of utmost importance for all those countries for whom indigenous policy, domestic and foreign is important. So there are two countries which I see, which I cover is New Zealand and Australia. And this is something that we would love to see more of that coming. It was probably never discussed. Maybe it was something which is unknown to the population in New Zealand about indigenous people of Ukraine. But let's talk about it. I'd be happy to, to engage more with Maori people who have been very welcoming to me. When I came, both your defense minister and foreign minister, that was great meetings I had, very compassionate, very deep, warm. I was moved by the prayer to the dead that um, foreign minister Nanaya Mahuta said in, in the meeting. Yeah, so let's take the questions. Thank you. Knowing about Ukraine is limited to news or television media on the media press. Then you said about the independence. Ukraine had independence since December 1991. What really went wrong in March 22 that you have ended up in such a big mess in uh, Russia? Just to know, because I don't know much about it. When you come on university. Oh, that's a very good question. It's, it's not about Ukraine, it's about Russia that you need to, to, to ask, but I'd be happy to tell you about Russia. I know Russian language very well. When I grew up, I only read books in Russian, but I always spoke Ukrainian at home. And guess why? Because there are no books in Ukrainian. Just where were very few books in my language I heard, but it's changed, right? 
that this is what was in Ukraine. Books for kids were only in Russian for one purpose, because the Soviet Union didn't want to promote any of the Ukraine language. So these are very two very different languages, by the way. This is like Spanish and Italian. They are similar, but they're different. Russians don't understand much of Ukrainian. We all know Russian because we were forced to learn Russian because Russia was a colony. But that's an advantage for Ukraine right now. We can help you. We can teach you Russian, right? <laughs> so basically what went wrong is actually what went wrong in Russia, not in Ukraine. And Russia went wrong, Vladimir Putin went wrong, right? right? When, when he came to power, look at the people who run Russia. This is the people who are over 70. This is a generation which, 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 were, which their prosperity was at the times of the Soviet Union. It's very basic. Look, when for ask anyone, what was the best time of your life? It's probably when you were young, right? Those people were young in the Soviet times. And this is very important to understand that people want to revive what they've seen when they were young. And that revival is a revival of the Soviet Union in a new form of a big empire. And you also have to look into the imperialistic, chauvinistic, racist um, regime of Russia. That's very important to know it. Russia, 20% of the Russian population is Muslim. Russia is a very multicultural country. But you don't see many ethnic groups represented in the Russian government. But if you look at the Russian soldiers who get killed in Ukraine, they are primarily from the ethnic minorities, primarily Muslim, primarily coming from those rural parts of Russia, which are very poor, impoverished. And they are encouraged to go to Ukraine on an adventure to make some money, rape somebody, loot, and then get killed. Russians are not drafting. Russian population, ethnically Russian population in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Why is that? Think about it. It goes a little bit deeper, but to those of you who study Russian, I don't know how many of you speak Russian here in the room? One, two, three, four. I mean, you would probably have a better picture of what Russia is and why it's ended up where it is. I always ask my Russian friends, like, so do you see democracy in Russia? Oh, that's a very good question. When do you think democracy is going to come to Russia? Oh, no, if democracy is going to come to Russia. And um, that's a tough question to ask because all the people around Vladimir Putin are, are, are no better than him. There is no opposition, no free media. Um, so who is going to be there leading Russia and change Russia to democracy? Can we impose democracy on a nuclear power? Well, it's a bit tough, huh? What if Russians use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine? What's going to be the response? <clears throat> How many Russian people live here in New Zealand? What's, what's their connection to Russia? How they feel? Are they out? I know many Russians are demonstrating along with Ukrainians and others, but many actually are compelled by the story which is shown by the Kremlin. The only reason Vladimir Putin was trying to prevent Ukraine's entry into NATO, this is very important for you to understand, is that if Ukraine joined NATO in 2008, or actually got on the track of membership, Russia would never be able to invade Ukraine. That's the one reason. That's the only reason. Because look, Finland and Sweden joining NATO. So according to the logic of Vladimir Putin, he must be invading Finland and Sweden as we speak here, now, immediately, before they fully join. Right, correct? Look, Finland is 30 kilometers away from St. Petersburg, 30 kilometers. This is too close to, to be to NATO. How is that gonna reconcile with, with Russia's insecurity or legitimate concerns they have. 30 kilometer border to, to, I mean, this is kind of dangerous, right? So they, they must preemptively invade Finland now. Don't you think? According to the logic. Will they do it? I doubt it. They're too weakened by the war in Ukraine. 
But buying to the Russian narrative can be very convenient because it gives you answers to the questions, right? You need to question more. I mean, that's an RT's question. I question more. Don't trust your government. Your government is fooling you. Vaccination, no good for you. <laughs> Malign foreign influence is extremely detrimental. It could be pernicious, it's dangerous. The way Russia tailors its messages is very different depending on what, who they target. In the Middle East, in Latin America, they build on their anti-American sentiment. In democracies, they invest into the far right, far left movements. In countries like New Zealand, they have only one goal, to undermine trust towards conventional government and media. Once you undermine the trust, you can spread many different conspiracy theories that people will believe in. And that's how you can actually solve discord in a society. You find a weakness and you pummel it. And it's actually not very cheap and easy because uh, you can have people out somewhere in Moscow, thousand people with the most sophisticated technology, cameras, access to internet. You can create any video you want out there. And Russians are very good at it, by the way. And then have a voiceover from New Zealand with a New Zealand accent. Nobody would even guess that it's not from New Zealand. And then you can spread it and push a little bit in Twitter and Facebook and TikTok and other media. And people will buy into that because it looks genuine. It's cheap. In the past, Soviet propaganda was boring and dull. Nobody believed in it any, anyways, right? Even the Soviet Union. So people would read Pravda, but in the kitchen, they discuss different other topics. Nobody believed in that. But this Russian propaganda today is extremely sophisticated. Once I watch Russian news, I'm like, damn, that's very convincing, huh? So compelling, so passionate, emotional. It's very theatrical. People get engaged because it mixes emotions, it mixes current affairs, and then it mixes lots of lies. But then if you spin it all together, it looks like a very compelling argument, especially if you don't know much about anything, right? You just believe in that. And I'm like, damn, I watch Russian news one and so on because I have to. I'm like, can you watch it every day for 22, three years? I mean, that, that's, you just believe, this is like, becomes like a Bible for you. You don't even question it. You just, you just, it just that's it. It's holy great. Holy great, holy great. Yeah, anyways. Um, there are a number of uh, questions um, piling up online, um, including some, some really good ones. This one's from um, Professor Ruben Azizian, um, and he's asking, uh, we well, thanks the ambassador um, and enjoyed your talk, but what is the assessment of China and India's perspective on the war in Ukraine? Do you see any shifts in their position? Look, uh, China is very important, this whole uh, arrangement. Uh, I think there is no more, no other country in the world which can probably stop this for now, um, to be frank. Uh, China has got a leverage over Russia. We have good relations with China. And China maintains very good relations with Russia. And uh, we are trying to get direct communication with China. Um, recently, President Zelensky spoke at the Australian National University. Maybe some of you have seen it. Uh, he got a question on, on China. He said that he's been requested a direct meeting with Xi Jinping and then a direct phone call. Uh, this is what we see. Uh, we in Ukraine believe that it's not in the interest of, of China. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is not helping China. As China is the largest importer of commodities in the world. As the prices for those commodities are going up, China has to pay more for steel, for food, for energy. Um, Russia is only one eighth of the Chinese economy, maybe smaller. Russia is a good resource for China because it's fossil fuels and food and timber. But the relationship that used to be between the Soviet Union and China back in the day when China was poor has changed. So now China is rich, China is powerful. China is actually the country which can influence Russia. It's interesting, maybe some of you who study that part of the world, you have observed um, some riots in Kazakhstan earlier this year. And Tokayev, the leader of Kazakhstan, invited Russian troops into Kazakhstan to subdue the riot. And then they withdrew. Do you remember when and why Russian troops withdrew? 
right, after the phone call between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, they all left Russia, uh, Kazakhstan. It was actually very interesting to watch because China is heavily invested in Kazakhstan, which is also a big uh, country which has huge deposits of natural resources. And China invested lots of money there. Americans have invested as well. But, China, but Kazakhstan has managed to actually diversify its investors. And they also have, I think, some one of the largest, um, what is called dry ports, which is, uh, is actually located in Kazakhstan for the transit of goods from China to Europe uh, through, by railway. So China was able to, to give it a push and, and stop it from happening. So China is, is an important player, given you have a friendly relationship with China, maybe you could help us. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, I suppose, uh, or we do want peace for the Ukrainian people and for Europe. Uh, and uh, how do you see that happening? How long is it going to take and how is it going to happen? So I'll, I'll just relay the question for online people online. So um, uh, the question is, obviously, we want to see peace in Ukraine. How do you see that happening? How long is it going to take? Uh, look, nobody knows. Uh, uh, I don't. Um, you know, it just to be, if to be kind of short, right? Uh, but a lot will depend on our ability to, to fight. Uh, if we get the right weapons, if we get long-range missiles, tanks, and jets, maybe we can finish it sooner. Since we're not getting it, it may be prolonged because uh, we don't have the right weapons to fight. You see, Russia understands strengths. Uh, that's very clear. Um, all the Western leaders for Russia, for Vladimir Putin, uh, are weak because he's seen many who, 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 who just are not there anymore, right? And for him, he's just laughing out loud at all those global leaders because they change, they're weak. He doesn't, he's always there. And he's there until he dies, right? And, and that's the whole problem. So he is exploiting that. He's also blackmailing the world. The food crisis, which is unveiling and sort of unfolding, was one of the ways to, to leverage um, the influence, blackmailing, sort of cutting the supplies of energy to Europe, another one. And actually, you know, because escalation can be vertical, it could be horizontal. Horizontal, Russia attacks another country, right? Vertical, Russia uses technical nuclear weapons. Escalation is possible. But look, for us, we, there is no country in the world which want peace, uh, it's Ukraine. And there's no other country which started this war and wanted the war. It's Russia, it's only one country. And uh, it's very clear, you know, we just have to understand it. And that's it, you know. Um, I've got a question here from Annette Milligan. Um, she's asking what can be done to keep Ukraine front of mind for longer than six months? Um, and it, it's an interesting question in my mind too, considering there's been quite a bit of talk about the effective communications of President Zelensky and um, his efforts to influence opinion and, and um, uh, you know, keep Ukraine um, on top of the news agenda. So I mean, if you could look, comment on that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it depends on your government, actually. Because, look, it's all country-specific in a way, right? Because at the end of the day, media is very uh, <coughs> national. Though you can read any other English media, you still prefer New Zealand media, right? You don't, well, you probably listen to BBC, I would imagine but how much of American media you watch, right? So it's all very domestic. And domestic coverage depends on what's happening here in relation to Ukraine. Like for instance, Ukraine is hosting a Crimea platform conference on the 23rd of, um, uh, of August, next week. If, for instance, your prime minister participates in the conference uh, and it's dedicated to Crimea, it's dedicated to indigenous people of Ukraine, it's dedicated to the reconstruction of Ukraine, then it will be covered by the media and you'll read about it. If your prime minister decides to go to Kyiv, it will be widely covered. You wake up tomorrow, you plug in and you can listen to the first exclusive interview of President Zelensky to uh, the New Zealand media. You know, this is one of the, you know, I'm demonstrating ways how it could be sustained or maintained. The most support New Zealand government sends to Ukraine 
the more often you read about that in the media, correct? So media depends on what's happening. Media cannot, and you see media is very dependent on your clicks because once you stop reading, clicking on the stories, media depends on advertisers. They just stop publishing stories about Ukraine because you stop clicking. And that's a difficult issue because nobody can force you click on a story unless you want to read it. Once you got tired of Ukraine, you're traumatized by the stories from Ukraine, you just stop reading it, right? I can't blame you, that's a fact, as cynic as it gets. And what do we do? I don't know, I mean, it's difficult. Of course, our political leadership has been very skillful in, in using comms as much as we can because we understand comms. And look, we're, we are different generation. Look at the people who, who are running Ukraine. We are people of, of 40 years old. Average age for politicians in Ukraine is probably 35. Average age of a politician in Russia is like 75, right? It's a different generation. Many people in Ukraine, just like me, were internationally educated. We want to change the country. We're different. We're Europeans. Uh, there were two questions here. Maybe let's take two questions right away. I'm asking for your guarantee that they won't end up in like I guess the far right extremist hands because there's a lot of them in Ukraine and I'm a bit nervous that you know we send over a javelin and next thing you know it somehow smuggled its way into France being used against uh, Muslims there. Yeah. So the question is: um, uh, is is there a risk of of weapons being sent from New Zealand um, finding their mm -hmm. way into um, uh, into other hands, not not for intended uses? Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, as in any war, there is always a danger there will be a spill out of weapons everywhere, right? We've seen it before. The problem is uh, some countries are very interested in amplify this message and, and push this narrative. And we see lots of that coming from Russia right now, trying to amplify the message that the weapons which the West is sending to Ukraine will end up uh, elsewhere. And, and, and the only reason it's done is to undermine Ukraine as a credible partner, as a credible recipient of those weapons. Uh, of course, we, we are cognizant of that, and we understand that we need to establish a system of how we can keep track of what we get. But at the end of the day, it's a war, right? So a lot of the weapons end up in the Russian hands. And what Russians do with those weapons, we don't know. Where they can send those weapons and then make pictures and, and publish the stories that it ended up elsewhere, and the weapons which were sent to Ukraine were used elsewhere against some civilians. If I were a Russian, I would probably do it to undermine trust towards Ukraine. You see, it becomes very um, slippery slope about how you can twist the whole story. But look, um, that's the whole point of Russia is to undermine trust towards Ukraine. And this is what Russian propaganda has been working on for the past 20 years, but more importantly, during the last eight years. Uh, of course, there's all this danger. And I'm not saying that Ukraine, Ukraine has got its own issues, but at the end of the day, it was Russia which invaded Ukraine. And we're now fighting, defending our democracy, as fledgling at it as it is, but it is a democracy in the middle of Europe. And that's important to understand it. Yeah. Probably got time for two more questions, I think. Yeah. Um, so so uh, maybe one here, Angus, and, and, and one. That's quite one question. Do you think this would have played out differently if Alexei Navalny had stayed in exile? So the, the question was, would this have played out differently if um, Alexei Navalny had stayed in exile? Look, uh, I don't share fascination about Alexei Navalny, though he's definitely a political prisoner. Uh, but when Alexei Navalny was asked a question about Crimea, he, he believed that Crimea is, is Russia. As we often say in Ukraine, the Russian liberalism asks, ends on the question on Crimea. As any Russian liberal or Crimea, you will hear the answer. Because even in the liberal circles, the imperialistic ideas are still dominating in many different, for different reasons. I mean, I'm not trying to discredit that. Of course, it's only in source of possible change we can have there that Russians can actually topple Putin themselves and they can do it with their own hands. So we don't need to get involved, right? But can Russians topple Russia, Putin or not? And can they actually change the whole system? Because everybody in Russia is petrified. I got this question the other day, why not all those rich Russians take over Putin, right? I'm like, 
No, you don't understand. Those wealthy Russians are not wealthy. They just carry Putin's money. They're nobodies. And they can get killed like this. They're petrified of Putin. They will never tell anything to him. They just carry his money and he just tells them how to spend it. And uh, they, they don't, they haven't made those money themselves. It's not theirs money. So th that's a whole problem. People don't get it. And uh, that's important to understand, yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah, sure. Um, a practical question. Um, coming back to New Zealand and civil society, you have talked a lot about government to government assistance. Um, I'm interested in how New Zealand civil society on a voluntary basis can assist Ukraine right, right now, not so much the long term <laughs> reconstruction because that's not happening while the war's on. Or is that, I mean, yeah, you're obviously doing some reconstruction, but essentially, how can New Zealanders? On a personal voluntary basis. Look, this is Ukraine. yeah. This is a very good question. And uh, should you? So, so, sorry, I was just saying. The question is, uh, how can New Zealanders, uh, on a voluntary basis, help help Ukraine right now? In different ways. Uh, it depends on, I mean, what NGO you represent, for instance. But I know that there are many fundraising events hosted in different parts of New Zealand. People raising money, sending money to NGOs in Ukraine who are distributing humanitarian assistance. <laughs> Uh, you can go on a mission to Ukraine, deliver that humanitarian assistance. If you are in uh, therapy, there is a great deal which needs to be done on the post-traumatic syndrome. The whole society is traumatized. Uh, there is a great deal you could do just come into Ukraine and teach English because kids could benefit from your teaching of English. You can provide opportunities for Ukrainian students to come and study at the universities in New Zealand, give them scholarships, give them fellowships. They will get educated here, they'll go back to Ukraine to rebuild the country. Now, those people who fled Ukraine that didn't want to leave Ukraine, those who wanted to leave Ukraine, they left Ukraine 20 years ago as labor migrants, but those who left Ukraine now, they had a fine life in Ukraine. They all want to go back. I haven't met a single family here in New Zealand or Australia who want to stay here. You should understand it. It's a different kind of, they were forced to leave. Especially with the older people I met here, who came and because they were invited by their kids, all of them want to leave, like tomorrow. They can't wait until they can go back tomorrow. Because for people, for all the people, they don't know any other life than in Ukraine. They don't know English. They don't have friends here. You see, for them, they just can't wait to go back. They don't want to stay here. Though it's a beautiful country, but you know, you've been with your kids for a month or two, and then you want to go back to your life. That's it. So, so look, uh, in any way you can, and there are different ways you can get to Ukraine. I've traveled to Ukraine twice since I came to Australia. I was there in early June and later in July. A little bit complicated in terms of logistics, but you're flying to Warsaw. Uh, you then come to Zhasho, which is a city closest to the border with Ukraine. You get on a bus or a train, you get into Ukraine, uh, and, and you can help. You can, you can work for free. You can be volunteer. I mean, different ways. There are some rich people maybe in New Zealand who want to help. They can rebuild the school. They can rebuild the hospital in different ways. They can help in municipality on a municipal level, on the regional level, on the national level. So, so my idea, and it would be great if, for instance, uh, ANZAC, um, Australia, and New Zealand could participate in Ukraine's reconstruction. And I'm looking at, for instance, a maritime region in Ukraine, which could be rebuilt, for instance, Mykolaiv. And now different countries have adopted, adopted different regions in Ukraine to assist with reconstruction. Like the UK is helping the Kyiv region. Denmark is helping with Mykolaiv, but I'm sure you can join forces with Denmark. Uh, Portugal, Portugal is helping with Zutomer. And of course, we have one reconsul of Poland here. Poland has been our friend and supporter. 3.5 million Ukrainians in Poland. Can you just imagine that? Like, all of a sudden, somebody invades New Zealand and all 5 million from New Zealand have to go to Australia, like in two weeks' time. Can you imagine that? That's what happened in Ukraine. They fled Ukraine. Another 10 million are internally displaced. This is the, the example I use in, in Australia all the time. Imagine all the people of uh, Sydney and Melbourne are forced to leave Sydney and Melbourne, like in two weeks, and go to Adelaide and Perth and Brisbane. <coughs> what would happen? Where would they live? What housing? What schooling? 
what medical assistance they would get there. None, because the system is not created to actually accommodate this number of people. How many Ukrainians came here? You know, 200. 3.5 million people in Poland. This is just unbelievable. So just uh, sneak in one more. And we're the um, person at the back has been waiting for some time. I Oh, uh, look, sanctions work. They really work. Uh, extremely efficient. Uh, full embargo on the Russian oil, gas, and, 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 and natural resources. The problem is that there are those countries who impose those sanctions um, do not have, uh, do not, it, it has an impact on the Russian economy. All those companies which left Russia, which stopped trading with Russia, it's really, the Russian economy is in difficult shape, but it's still in a much better shape than the Ukrainian economy, where our GDP has dropped like 60% because we couldn't, be, we, you know, we couldn't export anything no steel, no food for, for six months. And Russia has been exporting everything and, they, and the prices for commodities have gone up. So they've been actually to being able to get the money they need to, to wage this war. So we need more sanctions, but you see the problem is how can you apply those sanctions? If uh, India and China keeps on buying Russian products, they keep on money coming in, right? And that's it. And, and look, I don't blame those Asian countries. Uh, the problem is that they have large populations to feed. And they have their own security concerns because if the prices for food are going to be rising in India, what that going to mean? What what's that going to bring to to Narendra Modi? It's going to create a political uprising because if people are hungry, they want to topple the government. He can't afford not to buy Russian food and energy. As simple as that. But you see, it's so complicated. I mean, it's so nuanced. It's not that straightforward, right? But of course, if India and China stop buying Russian products, maybe we could end the war. But how can we influence India and China to stop buying Russian products? Who can do that? Nobody, I think. You know? it, yeah, so sanctions work, more sanctions. Russian assets everywhere, in New Zealand included. It's difficult to track and trace them because they're all under you know, different shell companies. One shell company owns another shell company, and you can't really trace it back to the beneficiary, final beneficiary, who's a friend of Putin, and, and it's difficult to, to connect the link, right? And you had democracy at the end of the day. So even there are sanctions imposed, your assets are frozen if you, you discovered them, but how can we use those Russian assets to rebuild the country? It has to go through your judicial system. Well, I trust the judicial system of New Zealand, but there are not many countries where you can trust the judicial system. And it's only the democracies where we can probably pursue this avenue of taking over the Russian sovereign assets and also private assets linked to Putin to use that money for the rebuild. And we need about a trillion dollars to rebuild. It's huge. There was also a question from you, I think. You wanted to ask something because you speak Russian, so I'd be very curious to hear you. I'm actually originally Okay. So, I had two questions, one about sanctions as well, and um, other aspect of the sanctions is the proposed sanctions on its citizens, so to ban Russian. There are an ongoing discussion whether it's going to really hit Putin's regime or it could hit people in Russia who don't mm. support the war. But the question I wanted to ask is uh, uh, actually not about Ukraine, but about Belarus. And um, so, um, I, I used to live in Belarus and uh, it was 20 years I lived here under the Russian regime and well, we moved here. And two years ago, there was like massive pro democracy movement, and absolutely peaceful in, in Belarus. Um, unfortunately, there was massive crackdown on it, and a lot of uh, Belarusians who had to flee the country ended up in Ukraine. And I'm very uh, grateful for the Ukrainians to accept. So they accepted them. Now, that, of course, the war ended to leave the country. But uh, what I'm going to uh, ask is uh, the context of this war, I think, um, because we saw that the peaceful process yeah. didn't work, the absolutely peaceful process didn't work in Belarus. I think the biggest challenge.
chance for governance. Um, they found a truly democratic country because the I mean, people of Belarus states they have the common values as Ukrainians. They, yeah. they want democracy, they, they tired of living under this regime. But so the victory of, of Ukrainians is the biggest chance for Belarus. That's what happened. Uh, what's your perspective on, on the on the Belarus? And yeah, sure. I know a lot of companies. A lot of people are fighting, Belarus and fighting. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you think after the victory, after the Ukrainian victory, which uh, I hope is going to come soon, right? what is the chance of Belarus? So, so the, the question is, what uh, what effect will the war in Ukraine have on the prospects for democracy in Belarus? Hopefully I'll capture that. Look, uh, definitely Belarus is, is, is as Belarusian people, people of Belarus are very friendly to Ukraine. I have many friends from Belarus. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Lukashenko regime is different. And, um, and um, but maybe one of the reasons why Belarus had to provide their land for, for, for the Russian troops to invade Ukraine, but nevertheless, uh, the, Russian, the Belarus troops did not go into Ukraine. I don't know what's the reason for that. I know that Russians have been pushing Belarus troops to invade Ukraine, but they still resisted. Um, the stories I hear come to the fact that Belarus soldiers did not want to fight in Ukraine. And there was such a heavy resistance in the armed forces that even they, Russia, sent key generals to run Belarus troops. They wouldn't report back and they wouldn't listen to what Russian generals were saying. And I think it became very dangerous for, for, for Lukashenko. And Lukashenko is trapped. He's, it's lose-lose for him. He's got his son uh, in Moscow as, 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 a, as a hostage. Uh, he understands everything depends on Putin. Putin can, can take him out anytime, and he totally depends on Putin. So Putin helped uh, Lukashenko to crack down on the democratic movement there two years ago. Many Ukrainians actually were there uh, because we, you know, we, we love democracy. We've been there helping. And now I don't know how many Belarus uh, soldiers actually fighting and help with Ukraine against Russia, but there are many, and many IT people because for a long time Belarus was was also like a big IT and software development hub for for in Eastern Europe. Now I know many of those software people moved either to Ukraine or Poland or elsewhere. Are you in software development? Yeah. Exactly. You see, uh, so 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 we've got this talent out there, which is a low hanging fruit because. There is so much we can do in software development here with New Zealand, by the way, that was also a question of what, what else we can do. But look, Belarus is a tough question. Of course, if we win, your chances are much higher, you know, to topple Lukashenko and to join us in our aspiration in joining the European Union, because at the end of the day, this is where prosperity is gonna come. It's in the EU with all the money which gonna come from the EU, which is next door, uh, access to the big market, to, you know, to develop democracies. Uh, we don't see any other future for ourselves uh, than, than being part of the EU. Look, uh, it's two hours, 30 minute flight from Kiev to Paris. Two hours, 30 minutes. This is like a quick flight from what, Wellington to Sydney. I fly from Canberra to Perth. I fly four, point, four, four hours, four hours and a half. In four hours and a half, I can get from Kiev almost to Lisbon. That's the distance. So we are in the heart of Europe, the same as Belarus. So, so, so we, we just... Uh, we, I think we just were more lucky in Ukraine. We had more rulers and different leaders, whereas you, you were stuck with Lukashenko since 1994, right? So it's been a long time, and longer than in, than, than in Russia. But look, um, and Lukashenko has been very skillful in kind of being there on a balance. Uh, and, uh, and, but, but I think this time, uh, I mean, it's he just, it's lose-lose for him. He's trapped and uh, it's just... Whatever the outcome of this war is, I think he's done and he understands it. So he just, I don't know, I'll be surprised if we win this war and he survives, I don't think so, yeah. Um, I mean, we're time is pressing and the ambassador has a very busy day um, and with apologies, we didn't quite get to all the all the questions, um, but I'd, I'd personally like to thank the ambassador for such an eloquent, uh, thought-provoking um, and, uh, um, uh, well, well presented um, address to us today. Before we we leave, I just want to invite up um, Dr. Tatiana Bukliash, who's a director of the Europe Institute at the University of Auckland, just to provide some concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, Your Excellency, um, Mr. Miroshnichenko, right, and uh, uh, Dr. McDougall. Um, it's my great honor to be able to uh, provide just a few brief closing remarks for this event. I'm very grateful to Dr. McDougall for uh, offering this opportunity to um, Europe Institute to co-host this event, and I look forward to a lot of future events that we can um, uh, co-host and co-organize together. So I'm here on behalf of the Europe Institute. I have been appointed a director of the Europe Institute in July, so just a month ago. Um, this is a research center and a, a platform for collaboration or, with Europe and European Union and for the study of Europe, its past, its present, its future. And since the beginning of the aggression on Ukraine in, in late February this year, we Ukraine has been on our minds in the Europe Institute, and we have tried to engage in many different ways with various New Zealand audiences, uh, public, our colleagues at the university, diplomats, through various channels, um, from roundtables to public events, to try to explain, describe, contextualize what's happening in Ukraine. And I'm really grateful for now being able to co-host um, representative of Ukrainian government. And, and thank you so much for your very frank and, and thought-provoking, I'm sort of bringing together climate change and, and the war and food security and everything together. Now, oh, and we are yeah, delighted. But on this occasion, I can't help also to think about some my own personal um, uh, history. And uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not a born and raised Kiwi. I come from, I was born and what used to be Socialist Republic of Croatia, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And uh, my own youth was marked by terrible war in the 1990s. So I remember very vividly trying to study by candlelight in Eretz during airstrikes and bombing. Um, and I can feel, and when you know the war on Ukraine started, I, these memories kept on coming back and I kept on thinking about Ukrainian children, students, people in Ukrainian towns and who had to now unfortunately go through what we went through and, and actually much worse, I fear. Um, so, I also remember what it meant for Croatia to receive expressions of support and actually some um, help from other countries. And it's actually, I think, appropriate place to say that actually Ukraine, together with Latvia, was the two first two countries to recognize the independence of Croatia. And it was only after uh, that that actually Germany and other countries that are a bit more powerful recognized independence. So just, you know, so much about countries that seem a bit smaller and less powerful and their voice in international politics, what it means. So, um, and I want to kind of just reflect very briefly, this, the title of this talk was Cooperation is Crucial. Without the support of other countries, military, but also economic, political, the war in Croatia would have likely lasted longer and would have had much worse consequences than it had, and it was terrible as it was. Um, and here in New Zealand, as um, ambassador also very, um, uh, I think in, in response to your uh, question summarized for us, I mean, um, he gave us the answer to this question that I often hear in New Zealand, not maybe so much among the colleagues of the university, but in the, you know, just <laughs> everyday people. So what can we do with such a small country? And this is the sort of um, thing that New Zealand is so small, so far away that there's very little we can do about climate change. Our decarbonization doesn't matter. Very little we can do in sort of world politics. What does it matter for Europe? And as His Excellency um, remarked and sort of explained, is actually quite a lot. And if it's not military aid, we certainly things that can be do in terms of economic support um, and um, uh, using political voice and New Zealand's reputation. Uh, I find it very interesting, your remarks about indigenous uh, diplomacy, which is something I haven't personally reflected on, but thank you very much on that. And just kind of going back to um, where, um, just a kind of as a kind of happy end, like the war in Croatia ended in 1995, the country was rebuilt and it became member of European Union a little bit later than we hoped, but it did. So I hope for this happy end for Ukraine that deserves to assume its membership in, in European Union. So I um, just want to end by proposing um, a vote of thanks, primarily to <laughs> our start with our speaker today, His Excellency Vasily Miroshichenko. And also to the organizers, um, 
New Zealand Institute of Internal, International Affairs, and it's also fairly recently appointed director, Dr. McDougall, and I host today a University of Auckland and uh, School of Law. Thank you very much, and everybody here.